really good turnout when you tell people you know what's going to happen to them when they die. Oh my God. When they start putting that at the bottom of all our flyers, like Buffalo State Free Thinkers, we're going to be discussing animal rights, and we know what happens to you when you die. So. Um, but anyways, yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I see a lot of new people, so just real fast, uh, my name is Casey Brescia. I'm the president and co-founder of Buffalo State Free Thinkers. Uh, we're a new club on campus. We started uh, here the two uh, spring of 2011. And uh, yeah, um, this semester, every Friday, we have discussions on what we think are like the big questions in life. Uh, we've done animal rights, feminism, um, uh, really um, all sorts of stuff. We have, we've actually done death conversations before, too. And um, yeah, uh, it's, always, it's always a lot of fun. Um, if you don't have your mind blown at least once per meeting, uh, then something has gone horribly wrong. So you guys should really come check it out. Um, so anyways, uh, the reason we had this event is because um, Conversation about death in today's society in America is, and pretty much everywhere is just dominated by religion. There's just no secular conversation about it going on, and um, that's not really fair. <laughs> so we wanted to change that, and uh, we thought, who better do that than Mr. Tom Clark? Uh, he's a philosopher. Uh, he's the founder of the uh, Center for Naturalism in Boston, and uh, the author of Encountering Naturalism, A Worldview and Its Uses. So, Tom Clark, everyone. Okay, thank you, Casey. And uh, can everyone hear me okay? How's the mic working? There is no mic. <laughs> okay, that solves that problem. And I am not Dr. Death. Dr. Death died himself. That was good old Jack working, as you know, right? So uh, I think Jack was doing good work, but what I want to get into is the philosophy of death, uh, so called. And the talk today, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Buffalo state free thinkers for being as adventurous as they are to have this, to have this conversation at all and then to invite me to do it. I'm, I feel very privileged and honored to be here. The Center for Naturalism, based in Boston, uh, go to naturalism.org to read all about it. We've been in existence for about 12 years and we're promoting worldview naturalism and uh, as you'll see in the talk, one of the things we're interested in is existential questions. And what could be more existential than death? I can't think of anything more existential. Uh, after all, it's the end of your existence. <clears throat> so uh, this talk is based on an article that was published in the Humanist magazine about, I think, in 1995. It was a cover story with a big black swirl going down, sort of the, uh, it pinpointed into nothingness. That was the idea, I think. Death, the death spiral, that's what it was, the death spiral. Anyway, the humanist had this as a, as a cover story. So the, this talk uh, is based on an article which you can find online at naturalism.org slash death.htm. So have a look at that. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, right. I, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question now, but it's be thinking about the answer to this question. What, and don't say it if you know, what Bogart film, Humphrey Bogart film, had a title that didn't have the word death in it, but referred to death. Don't say it if you know. I'll say the question again, and I'll ask at some point during the talk, what film starring Humphrey Bogart had a title that referred to death, but did not have death, the word death in the title? OK, that's your question to be thinking about as we go along. Um, <clears throat> I really should be delivering this talk from a coffin horizontally on that table, but I thought better of it. Uh, all right, those are the only preliminary remarks. Now we can get into the, uh, the meat of it. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to talk a little bit. Well, here's the overview of the talk. We're going to talk about naturalism as a worldview. That's where I'm coming from. Consciousness and persons are natural phenomena. Death is the end of you, a, a particular person. And by the way, I should say, I hope to talk for about 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, then we can just open it up for questions and discussion. And thank you all for coming. So we'll talk about death as the end of you. This is a secular perspective on death, obviously naturalistic. And then I think there's a secular mistake, which I'm sure none of you ever make. People always deny making this mistake. But there is a secular mistake about death, which is to expect oblivion or nothingness at death. And I want to correct that mistake. Actually, the correction was done long ago by a philosopher named Epicurus as we'll see, but I want to expand on his correction and, and, and 
make it vivid by conducting a thought experiment about transforming consciousness, hence the title of this talk, Transforming Consciousness. And I'm going to say that death and birth is the radical refreshment of consciousness. Don't an anticipate nothingness, if that's your intuition. Anticipate somethingness. All right, uh, first a little bit about naturalism. As a worldview, right, based in science, there are six questions a worldview should answer, I think, at least six, and here, here they are. Big questions. I, I know what the, the free thinkers are all about big questions, so here are some big questions. How do we know what's real? That's your epistemology, uh, as the philosophers would call it. How, how do you decide what's true? How do you know your beliefs are secure and reliable? What exists? According to your way of knowing, what do you decide exists? That's your metaphysics and your ontology. And who are we? essentially. What kind of agents and, and beings are we according to a worldview that you happen to hold? Naturalism and Christianity have very different ideas about all these questions thus far. Another, another question is how ought we behave? Here, I don't think Christianity is quite as different as naturalism, but a worldview, whatever it is, should say something about ethics. And then how can we best solve our problems? The, personal, the applications, the apps, personal and public, practical applications, and then, getting to today's talk, what's it all about? The existential questions that we face about the meaning of life, the purpose of things, if there is such a thing, what happens after we die? <clears throat> How do we think about those things? So worldview naturalism, which is what the Center for Naturalism is engaged in promoting, has, not surprisingly, answers, it thinks, we think, to these questions. And what they are, are very quickly as follows. Our epistemology, or the way we know about things, is a matter of empiricism, a matter of public evidence. And naturalists decide facts about the world using basically science and empiricism. Our metaphysics, well, nature is what there is. Why do we believe that? Because there's no good evidence for the supernatural if you take empiricism as your way of deciding what's true about the world. Human nature, who are we? Well, we are evolved, natural, physical creatures completely within nature. And that establishes our connection with the natural world. Complete and utter connection in all respects, past, present, right now, and future. Our ethics, now this is, I'm not going to try to defend this, but I think naturalism gets us to a progressive, humanistic, and egalitarian way of treating one another. An ethical, ethical stance that is in favor of equal rights, because there's no scientific reason to deny equal rights to any group or class of human beings, unlike under some religious worldviews. Practical applications are based in a causal understanding of behavior. Cause and effect, as science shows, it gives us control. So this is the practical aspect of being a naturalist. There's nothing spooky going on, but because we understand cause and effect, we gain control over our lives. And so uh, our existential concerns, well, we're at home, at home, we come out of a wild universe that's not supervised. This is the atheistic aspect of naturalism. Atheism is just a corollary of, of a much broader worldview that I would call naturalism. So this is how worldview naturalism operates, how it answers the big questions. But today we're just going to be looking at one of them, an existential concern, the question of death. But to look at the question of death, I think we should at least talk a little bit about consciousness with one of my favorite topics. How many people here have heard of the hard problem? The hard, oh, you've got some thinking to do and you're in for a treat because if you haven't heard of the hard problem and you haven't been reading about consciousness, have you? <coughs> well, when you do, you'll discover David Chalmers, a philosopher who dubbed the mind-body problem that's been around for, for centuries, but he called it the hard problem. How do we explain consciousness? Well, what is consciousness? Well, if, like feelings of pain, pleasure, sensory experience, your thoughts going through your head, the emotions you're feeling, all the stuff that's happening in you mentally and sensorily, right? That's all part of consciousness. If you go to sleep, you're not conscious. If you're awake, we're all conscious now, having experience. And experience is associated with certain kinds of brain functions. And it turns out that not all brain functions support consciousness, just certain ones do. And they have to do 
with complex, integrating complex behavior, forming memories, learning novel behavior, being able to report things publicly like I'm doing right now. <clears throat> so that's, that's what we've learned a little bit, uh, what, what is, is associated with consciousness. Consciousness is also private. I can't see what's going on in your head. I can guess, but I can't see it. <clears throat> in fact, I can't see your, any of your sensations. I can't see your pain. All I can do is see the effects of your pain or pleasure or your emotions. No one has ever observed the pain. All you see are the neural correlates of pain in your brain. That's all, all that's been observed. Consciousness has never been observed by anybody, I would claim. So it's a private, subjective, qualitative reality in that sensations are qualitative states. They're not quantitative. But I, I won't get too much into that because that gets into the nature of consciousness. And, uh, but the main thing I want to suggest is that it's, it's, a, it's a private, subjective state. It's un unobservable from the outside. And your personality and conscious sense of self depend on the brain. This is what a naturalist would say. This is what the science-based view of ourselves says, is that consciousness is based in the brain. There's nothing immaterial that's needed to account for consciousness. But, so there's no soul necessary, I should say. Uh, there, there's no immaterial you, according to a naturalistic worldview. You're fully physical. So somehow consciousness, the sensory sensation of being a self, having experiences, and all experiences come out of what the brain does. That's what the evidence shows. But we don't know how it's done, which is why it's called the hard problem. There is no, and I, I look at this pretty carefully, as far as I, I can see, there's no received accepted explanation of consciousness out there in the scientific or philosophical community. There are lots of hypotheses and lots written about it, but there's no settled explanation of why it should be that brains operating in a certain way should give rise to conscious experience. People think they have the answers, some of them, but if there, there is no settled explanation like there is of genetic transmission or stellar evolution. So Sam Harris on his blog has two recent posts about consciousness, and he very rightly says it's an unsolved problem. And he draws attention to the, the difficulty of the hard problem. All right? But, now here's, here we're starting to get into the ideas of this talk. Consciousness, for each of us, is always present for itself. Subjectively, we are never absent from being here, right? <clears throat> you never catch yourself missing. You're always there catching yourself as a conscious subject. So this is a very curious fact about consciousness because objectively, I took a nap earlier today, conked out in the library, very comfortable chair, nice. I had no experience of that nap. All I had was the experience before I went to sleep, if indeed I, I think I slept, and then waking up. There was no subjective absence of myself that I experienced, right? So think about this. Every minute of your life that you're, you've been conscious is a continuous stretch of consciousness. This, you're never absent as a conscious subject, I claim. I think it's reasonable. I, I think maybe you can get that, <clears throat> but we'll come back to it. Okay, death. Here we go. Death is the end of you, naturalistically, from a scientific empirical standpoint. There's nothing about you that survives. Why? Because when your brain dissolves, as it will, unless it's somehow reconstituted, but and that we'll get into later. <clears throat> uh, all the functions that support consciousness end, so your consciousness ends too, right? I hope this is not too controversial, especially if you're uh, a secularist. If you're not, you're going to believe, you might believe in the soul that leaves the body at death and goes somewhere else. Uh, but I'm taking the naturalistic standpoint for granted here because uh, I have to operate from some premises, and that's what, so that's the premise we'll operate on here. Uh, we can talk about the, uh, the epistemological problem of whether this is soul or not later on, maybe. It's the, and death is also the end of the characteristics that define you. Your personality is encoded in your brain, your behavior, all your habits, all your movements. Everything that people recognize about you is physical, ultimately. The way your face looks, the way your voice sounds. Your personal, quirks of personality are neurally encoded. When that, the brain goes, you go. When the body goes and the brain goes, that's it. So in anything that comes after this, don't suppose that I'm 
depositing something that's going to survive death that, that is recognizably you. That's not what I'm going to be talking about. <coughs> so that's the, the natural uh, view of death. There's no evidence of anything non-physical that uh, continues after death. You're a physical being through and through, according to naturalism and science, and there's no anything, uh, evidence for anything non-physical. Memories of past lives, people claim to have them, and I think can be accounted for naturalistically. After all, memory, the experience of having a memory comes out of your brain, so we can, tr we, in theory, we could trace it to what the brain is doing. So that would explain the memory itself. Whether the memory refers to anything real, of course, is a matter of evidence. Does my memory of being living a past life have any other evidence going for it besides my claim to have the memory of it? That's the question if we're being empiricists. So I haven't seen any convincing evidence that uh, past lives are um, capture real facts about the world. But I'm not denying people have memories. It's just a question of whether the memories are refer to anything that actually happened. Okay? And then near-death experiences, I are perfectly real, going into the tunnel of light, and no doubt the experience is real, whether, and, they're, and, they're, and that they're naturalistically explicable. Whether crossing over after death into something else that is, brings along something non-physical about you, that's, that's what I'm denying. So uh, what else can we say? OK, so conclusion, death is the end of, I'll talk about myself here, it'll be the end of this consciousness, the end of this set of experiences, the end of me as a person. So I'm being pretty categorical about this. There's no woo here, nothing spooky or supernatural. All right? So the question that animates this talk is, what should we expect of death if we're naturalists, if we stick with science and evidence as how we know about things? What should we what should we anticipate? And what I want to say is that secularists uh, sometimes make a mistake. They expect oblivion at death. Now, I'll give you some quotes. There are actually many quotes in the paper, which is called Death, Nothingness, and Subjectivity. That first third of the paper is really to establish this point that people, in fact, suppose that when they die, they're going to fall into something they call either nothingness or oblivion or darkness. So here are some examples. And let's see. Casey, could you keep me on track as far as time goes? When we get to about 45 minutes since I started, just let me know. Thanks. Because uh, I might get carried away. All right, here we go. Here's Philip Larkin, a poet, wonderful poem called Obad. And I'll read this because it's, it so beautifully expresses what I think the secular mistake about death is. He says, Death, total emptiness forever, the sure extinction that we travel to and shall be lost in always. This is what we fear. No sight, no sound, no touch or taste or smell, nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with, the anesthetic from which none come round. Pretty compelling, dramatic expression of the idea of going into a place that you can't get out of forever the sure extinction that we travel to and shall be lost in always. Okay, so that's Philip Larkin. Here's Anthony Burgess, author of A Clockwork Orange. He's a novelist, and he wrote about death, and he's, he wrote as follows. And notice all the allusions to darkness and emptiness and nothingness here. He says, if there is only darkness after death, then that darkness is the ultimate reality. In the face of approaching blackness, which Winston Churchill facetiously termed black velvet, Concerning oneself with a world that is soon to fade out like a television image in a power cut seems like mere frivolity. So that's Anthony Burgess. <clears throat> and notice the references, darkness, darkness, approaching blackness, black velvet, fade out. All of this suggests that at death, he thinks he's going to go to a place of permanent darkness. Nothingness. Here's more. Isaac Asimov, good old Isaac. When I die, I won't go to heaven or hell. There will just be nothingness. Here's, in a nutshell, the, what, the mistake. I'm, I'm sure we, I, we could easily argue Isaac out of this mistake. But, and it might be a sort of casual expression, but I think some people are actually worried about this. Probably not you, but some people are. 
And here is the quote that starts the article that this talk is based on. For only death annihilates all sense, all becoming, to replace them with nonsense, an absolute sensation. Nonsense, the absence of sensation. And here's Arthur W. Frank, who had a heart attack. And he said about his heart attack, I will never lose that imminence of nothingness, the certainty of mortality. Nothingness again, awaiting us as, as we approach death. And finally, Larry Joseph was an AIDS patient. He says, I hope that when the time comes to face death, I will feel stronger and less afraid of falling into an empty black abyss. So here are at least some examples of what I think is uh, may, some people may expect when they die, they have this sense of impending what? Being plunged into a permanent extinction into nothingness. Here's the case against oblivion. What is it? It's to anticipate nothing or ne nothingness or oblivion is to project yourself into a situation after death. What is that? It's to suppose that we'll undergo non-experience and therefore inhabit nothingness. So it's really like to experience the, an absence of experience. And what would that be? Well, it would be blackness or an abyss or darkness or emptiness or nothingness. Now, Epicurus, a philosopher who lived uh, before uh, the Christian era, uh, I don't know his exact dates, was correcting this mistake. And this quote from Epicurus is pretty widely spread. It's, uh, he said, when I, am when I am, death is not, and when death is, I am not. So here is the correction of all those previous worries. When death comes, you're not there to experience it. You're not going to be around to experience the lack of experience or nothingness. You're not going to fall into an empty black abyss to reside there forever. You're not going to be there. So death is not a state into which you go. So the fact that Epicurus said this suggests to me that, in fact, the secular mistake about death is an intuition people actually have. Because this quote has survived the centuries, and it's brought up again and again to counter the intuition that some of us have, that we're at death, we're going to be plunged into nothingness. And Epicurus says, no, you're not going to be there, so death is not going to be a fact for you. But if, if that's true, that if, if death won't be an experienced fact for us, we, we don't undergo the end of experience. We don't experience the end of experience. All right? So that's, and this is sort of, I hope, a fairly straightforward case against oblivion or nothingness. But we're still left with the question, all right, if we're not going to be plunged into nothingness or blackness, what should we anticipate at death? And again, my answer will be not nothingness, somethingness. And here's how we do it. I want to conduct a thought experiment, which is the, basically the second two-thirds of the article that's online. A thought experiment which is designed to make it vivid that when you die, it's not going to be the end of experience. Now, the baseline for this thought experiment is just your everyday life. What do we notice? I mentioned this before. You never find yourself absent from, from the scene as, as a subjective, conscious being. Objectively, you lose consciousness regularly, right? You go to sleep, you might get knocked out, uh, have a surgery put on under uh, with an anesthetic. But those are never experienced moments for you. So you're always present before and after. And there no, there's no subjective gap that separates them. It's an instantaneous transition from one experience for the next. So here we go. Despite the fact that we are frequently and regularly unconscious, these unconscious periods do not represent subjective pauses between periods of consciousness. That's a quote from the paper because it's, it says very carefully what I'm trying to say. And here's another quote, pretty much. <clears throat> for the subject, that is you, for all of us. Whoop. Go back. <clears throat> for the subject, there is an instantaneous transition from the experience preceding the unconscious interval to the experience immediately following, following the uh, uh, unconscious interval. And this is true from the moment you gain consciousness at birth to you die. 
And what I want to do is call this, this continuous stretch of experiences, I want to call it personal subjective continuity. Personal because it's each one of us as a person has it. Consciousness is continuous from birth to death, and it's you that's consciousness. You are always here, present, in your life. You never are absent from the scene. And that's, I'm just going to call it personal subjective continuity. So this is the baseline. This is where we're at. Now comes the thought experiment. And here's the first step. Step one. What we'll do is we'll consider a spectrum of transformations um, from minimal transformations to radical transformations in the context of consciousness. And how do we do that? Well, of course it involves neuroscience and brains. How does it work? Well, I decide to engage in, in an experiment. Or I'll, I'll, I'll use myself. Or we, you think about yourself doing this. During an unconscious period, say I'm put to sleep, uh, and I agree during the, uh, my unconscious period to have some changes made in my, in my brain, let's say, by some very skillful neuros neurosurgeons. Uh, I, I give them my permission to do this. When I wake up, or you could actually say, maybe I've undergo surgery and a mistake is made, and a brain surgery, and, and the knife slips, and when I come out of surgery, I've got changes in my personality, and perhaps in my body too, but let's just stick with personality, uh, the brain at the moment. But I still recognize myself, and people recognize me when I come out of surgery. But what's happened? I'm a slightly changed person. You've been slightly transformed by the surgeon's slip or the intentional change that you've agreed to. Your personal characteristics, although recognizably still you, are slightly different. Your preferences for foods are, have changed. Maybe if you're uh, heterosexual, you've changed to homosexual. Uh, that would be a, a, a bigger change. But still, I could be recognizably me and have my sexual orientation change, right? So think about this. I th think this is, this is just a, uh, I think, a, an understandable reasonable hypothesis that this could happen. In fact, it happens naturally, unfortunately, in, in, in some surgical situations, that people undergo changes, personality changes, but they're still recognizably themselves. Okay, now, you've been under, you've been unconscious for a while, right? And when you wake up, what I want to claim is that even though your personality has changed slightly, or uh, there's still no subjective gap between the experience that you had when you were before the surgery and the experience when you wake up. There's still an instantaneous transition, right? Just like a regular sleep or nap, there's been no subjective gap. You, all you've got is the experience before surgery and the experience after. But you've woken up as someone slightly different. But there's been no subjective gap. That's all I'm trying to establish here in the, in the first minimal step of this transformation experiment. What are we doing here, by the way? We're transforming the context of consciousness. Consciousness is still continuous across this unconscious period, right? There's been no gap. But the context has changed at least a little bit, even though I'm recognizing it myself. So what does this mean? As in regular life, before the surgery, my personal subjective continuity is maintained across the objective interruption consciousness. The, the objective interruption was however long I was unconscious for, right? And my personal subjective continuity is maintained because I'm still me, even though I've, I've been changed slightly, right? I'm still recognizably Clark. You're still recognizably you. So what we can see here is that there's been no gap in consciousness. Consciousness is still continuous, and it's still continuous for you, even though you've undergone some changes. Now here's step two. What we want to imagine is a greater change in our spectrum of transformation cases, I want you to imagine that greater changes are induced so that a person who wakes up from this, this these modifications that have been made, uh, is no longer you. It could be someone that we're not sure about, or it could be someone who's recognizably definitely not you. So what, do we, what can we say about this? Well, we can say that there's no more personal subjective continuity. Why? Because you, you aren't there anymore, a new person now exists. Why? Because the neurosurgeons have made enough changes in the brain 
shall we say. And this is the thought experiment. That it doesn't matter whether we can do it now or not, right? Philosophers often use thought experiments where, of course, we, can, we don't have the technical capacity to precisely change personality, but it's conceivable that at some point we could. So go along with this and think of yourself being put to sleep. Uh, you wake up later, and it could be days later, and you could be moved to another town in the process. And when you wake up, you, uh, the person that wakes up is recognizably uh, not you. you. The memories have changed. The personality has changed. So there's no more personal subjective continuity because you're not there anymore. A new person, because of this transformation, a new person is there. But here's what I want to claim, and here's the crux. This is, this is the, the, the hinge of the argument. There has been no subjective gap in consciousness between my being, your being put to sleep and a new person waking up after this transformation. The new person's experiences follow directly yours. Now, let's just go over this again. In the original, in the mild transformation, I wake up it's slightly transformed, and I think we can agree that it's just like my going to sleep. It's just like when I wake up, I'm slightly different. And there's been no subjective gap. Now, what I'm suggesting is that if you make further changes in me so that I end up as a, a new person, we still should not suppose that for me, I go into nothingness and a new person comes out of nothingness. Rather, we have a continuous, a, a continuous uh, instantaneous following on of one experience from the other. So what I want to say is, if there are no subject, this is the point I just made, if there are no subjective gaps between you and the somewhat altered you, why should there be any gaps between you and the resulting new person? That's the claim. So if you get the idea of there being no subjective, gap, subjective gaps for you in regular life and then being slightly transformed, I think you should agree that once you're transformed into someone who's uh, who isn't you any longer, you, should, you shouldn't suppose that there's going to be a subjective gap. Because that additional change isn't something that would interrupt consciousness. So but this, is, this is the part that you might get hung up on. But I, but I think it's plausible. So here, here it is. Consciousness has been transformed. It has a different personal context. But consciousness is continuous across the transformation for the subjects involved. And the way we could express it is this. When I go, I'm, I'm always present in my life. I'm never absent. For the person who wakes up, they have an experience of being not being there. They wake up with their, say, new memories, their new personality. For them, they've always been there. And I want to say that the transformation, the, 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 the I, seeing how this works, should make it clear that there's no nothingness in which I, as a person, fall into when I cease to exist. And there's no nothingness out of which the new person that's the result of the transformation uh, comes out of. So that, that's the, this is the thought experiment. Uh, and it depends, what it depends on is buying, first of all, that there are no subjective gaps in ordinary, ordinary life, no subjective gaps when you've been transformed a little bit, and then no subjective gaps when you've been transformed a lot. Okay? So, here's the third step. Think about radical changes in, your, in, in, in yourself, in the time and location. The end, this is the far end of the spectrum of transformation. Imagine that you're put to sleep, the neurosurgeons make tremendous changes, so you're no, no, no longer recognizably you. They make changes in your body, change your body plan, perhaps. They can, they can do, these are very competent surgeons, uh, say, of the 25th century. They can, they can make you into anything they want. The important thing, is, though, is, given this radical transformation, you still have someone who is the result of this, con uh, of this transformation, who wakes up, perhaps, centuries from now in a galaxy far, far away, but there's still no subjective gap. You, there's still the, the experience you have when you're put to sleep, and then your continuer, the person that you've been transformed, or the creature you've been transformed into, has their first experience upon awakening, 
and there's been no nothingness, no black abyss of emptiness into which you've fallen and out of which the new creature or person has arisen. So what I want to suggest is, you, even in this situation, where you've been, you're, you're, say, put to sleep for centuries and end up um, moved uh, geographically far, far away and end up transformed radically, there's still no reason to think that consciousness isn't continuous between you and what and resulting whatever it is. I know this is getting increasingly hard to swallow. And that's, that's fine. Um, but what I want to say is that consciousness, again, is continuous across transformations in its personal context. And what I want to call this is generic subjective continuity. In other words, there's nothing in common between me and the thing that I've been transformed into, except what? The presence of consciousness for each of us. That's what's continuous. There's been no gap in, or sub, uh, emptiness or nothingness into which that I've experienced or out of which this new creature comes. For both of us, we've always been present. And this kind of continuity I would call generic. Generic because there's no particular person involved, but it's something that each person shares, namely the experience of being present, of being in the world, having a conscious perspective on the world, that's what's in common. And that's why I would call it generic subjective. It's subjective because it has to do with uh, consciousness. And it's continuous because we shouldn't expect there to be a gap. So radical transformation ends you, the person, so you've died, but consciousness continues. So the, pre the subject is still present for itself. There's no subjective gap or nothingness in, into which you have fallen. So I'm, this, this thought experiment is ma mainly designed to get you to sort of feel intuitively that the, the, the very idea of nothingness or blackness or emptiness is just not an option for you. So f finally, what to expect at death? Well, normal death and birth, what each of us will undergo, is a natural extreme case of radical transformation and generic subjective continuity. That's what I want to claim about normal birth and death. It's a transformation. It's just what? There's no continuer. There's no someone that you've been transformed into. It's just you die, and then there are all the rest of, of, of the subjects that come into being exist. What death is not, it's not the end of experience. And the, the, the thought experiment is meant to get you to see that. Death, instead, is the radical refreshment of consciousness. There's no personal subjective continuity after death. As, as I said at the beginning, death is the end of you. It's the end of all of us. There's nothing carried over. So there's nothing spooky or woo about this. It's completely naturalistic. What it depends on is looking at consciousness itself. Don't anticipate nothingness. Rather, anticipate somethingness, which is generic subject generic subject of continuity. Now, you don't know what it's going to be, and that's the, kind of the cool thing about death. We cannot know what our next, the next moment is going to be. But we can, can kind of guess. Consciousness is to exist as a point of view on the world, taking in and modeling the world, and it's presented to the subjective sense of being a self. That's what I think we can anticipate at death. At death. It's simply generic subjective continuity as another locus of consciousness. And it's not that I'm carried over, it's just that consciousness, consciousness is never absent for itself. It takes myriads of forms, and objective interruptions do not interrupt consciousness for itself. It's always there. So at death, anticipate somethingness. OK? Consciousness is always there, and for better or for worse, some lives are Lovely, some lives are, are difficult. So, what can we suggest? Make the best of it. And that's all, folks. Thank you. So, I'll just put up these. This is some contact information, and leave it up there. And we can entertain questions um, at lib. Oh. Before we get there, hold your questions. Did anyone guess the name of the film? Who has, anyone want to hazard a guess? The Big Sleep, the Big Sleep. congratulations. <laughs>
Does everyone, everyone get it? The big sleep? That, that was the, the metaphor, the simile for death. And congratulations, you've just won Encountering Naturalism, a worldview that it's uses. And the talk that otherwise would have been given was going to be about free will. And this is the myth of free will, not by me, but a, a, a wonderful writer. So pick these up later. <coughs> I forgot to mention there was going to be a prize. You would have thought party. I Googled it. Did anyone else have an inkling? Of, did it, has anyone else here seen The Big Sleep? Yeah. Oh, boy. All right, the hard problem of big sleep. That, those are your assignments. Uh, so, does it, any of this seem plausible? I, Casey nodded, nodded his head, but oh, we've got a, in the back. Yes, I think red-haired woman had 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 her hand up that I saw first in the glasses. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep, right. Uh, I don't think it necessarily rests on it because even a glimmer of consciousness is consciousness itself. So as we come out of a nap or a sleep or surgery or a radical transformation, the, 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 the coming to full consciousness might be gradual. Indeed, that's what happens at birth, right? Where there's a very gradual uh, onset of uh, consciousness probably. You know, the status of consciousness at birth, that's it's hard to assess. But let's say right out of the womb, you feel pain. Let's just assert that. Okay, so this is the first experience of crying and, and being startled. Now, but even if, the, even if the, uh, coming out of an app or sleep is a gradual process, it's still consciousness. Well, I guess the, the better way to put it is, as, I, as I've also said, is that you don't ever experience yourself having no experience. However, however attenuated experience is, it's still, still experience. You're still there, even though you might not identify yourself as being a particular person. And in fact, that, that kind of reinforces the idea of generic subjective continuity. As you come into consciousness, you haven't identified yourself as a particular person, have you? You're just kind of conscious. And then, oh, it's me here. So that's actually an interesting way to look at this whole transformation, is that it's the, it could be that the gradual onset of consciousness reinforces the argument. So thank you for bringing that up. You're <laughs> now, sir in the hat, you had your hand up and then... Yeah, well, I was going to say, it makes sense because for death to be nothingness, you have to perceive the nothingness. Right. I mean, that's the obvious... Right. Yeah. That, that, that's the obvious rejoinder to anyone who supposes that death is nothingness or oblivion, oblivion is that it's, they think it's a state that they're, they're experiencing. But what would that be? There's, nothingness doesn't exist, so we can't experience it, and being unconscious is the absence of experience. So, yeah, I mean, that, you're right. That's, that's basically Epicurus's point, I think. So, and then the man in the beard. Uh, yeah. See, yes, I know, see, I do realize what you're saying about how, you know, um, how if you're not there to experience it, then you can't really be experiencing nothingness. It's just that, you know, in order to experience Right, because you're not there to, you're, yeah, you end. Um, so when I say, and I say this in the paper, when I say you should anticipate somethingness, obviously it's not you. It's going to be 
all the loci, the, all the con different contexts of consciousness that come into being or that exist are going to be experiencing something. Now, uh, pe people find this a bit of a cheat because of course it's not going to be you with your personal characteristics that's going to be having this somethingness. But I guess it's a counterweight to the idea that you are going to have an experience of nothingness. Because that's, that makes the mistake of projecting you into a situation following death. No, that's not going to happen. So what I'm suggesting is we're not projecting you into a situ situation following death. What we're looking at is the subjective, the, the subjective fact that consciousness is never absent for itself. And the transformation experiment was meant to show you that when you change the con context of consciousness, you're not putting in gaps. You're not putting in little things of nothingness. So no matter how, how big the transformation is, we can always think of it as continuous. So, and that's meant to reassure people that, you know, when the final moment comes, the curtain comes down. The curtain, when it comes down, is not going to bring blackness. We can't anticipate that, but yet, as I think I showed you, a lot of people do. So, this is, it might be just a very, a very long story to get to a very simple point, but I still think it's an interesting story, uh, when you, and it brings up an important point about consciousness, the fact that consciousness is a subjective reality that is always present for itself. Whereas objectively, we can see the context of it are disappearing, go away, and are not around for eons. But when they come back, they've never not been there for themselves, curiously enough. So, uh, yeah. Um, I, I kind of buy your point that uh, there's consciousness and there's more consciousness. <laughs> yeah. There's death in the middle of it. <laughs> Did anything upset my point? Yes! <laughs> Something probably good. I don't want to be dogmatic. That would be betray my deepest principles. So, yeah, uh, objectively speaking, uh, we can imagine, first of all, why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, it could have been nothing, and, and no consciousness could ever have existed. Um, but that's not the case. And once you've got consciousness on the scene, it's never absent for itself. But objectively speaking, yeah, at, at the, the heat death of the universe, there would be no more subjects. But that wouldn't be a fact for any subject that ever existed. So it wouldn't be, a, as Epicurus said, it wouldn't be a problem for them. It certainly wouldn't be an experienced state for any possible conscious subject. So should subjectivity worry about the heat death of the universe? Yeah, well, of course we can't help it because we want to, you know, we want to persist. We wanna, the interesting thing about ourselves is that we want to continue as ourselves, but as I suggest at the paper, why are we so worried about consciousness continuing in this context? I mean, what's so great about me? I mean, especially if we understand that when we die, it's not going to be nothingness. That's not an option. So that's why I suggest that you know, death is the radical refreshment of consciousness, and maybe if not welcomed, at least we, can, we can, should be... Um, which I say, wondering, deeply wondering as, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. What's the next moment? What's the next moment? And then we know it's not going to be blackness. It's not going to be emptiness. There's another whole way to think about this, which is physicists talk about the block universe. They would know what the block universe means. Space time is a four dimensional block universe. Einstein showed this, this theory of relativity pretty much established for many physicists that the universe is a single block of, uh, of a space-time continuum in which all events are equally existing. The past exists, the present exists, the future exists. Einstein said that uh, for a physicist like myself, time is, is, is an illusion. He said this at a funeral of his, of his friend. So from a from a physics standpoint, the block universe contains all events, and so in a sense, we're always present in it. This is, this is a, 
sort of another perspective, but it's a, it's a way of, of, of seeing that, yeah, even from a physical standpoint, we, uh, we persist as space-time events. So look at Google or uh, have a look at the block universe. It's also called um, eternalism as opposed to presentism. And it's the physical view of time that many uh, scientists hold. Not, not, it's not universal, but it's, uh, it, check, check that out as well. It's sort of another perspective on the idea of being immortal in some sense. I don't know if we should want that, but there it is. Casey. Um, I was thinking, um, we always talk about death as being bad, but uh, in order for something to be bad, don't we have to experience it? Um, and then in that sense, um, what then, what is, uh, here I say that bad is death, it's not articulated well, then what is bad about death if we can't experience it? Right. Well, clearly uh, death is, is bad if you want to accomplish things or get things done or help people that, um, or you can be egocentric or altruistic about it, but it's certainly the end of your contribution. So it's bad in that respect that um, if you wanted to get things done, obviously you can't. Uh, it's not bad in the sense that it's something that you'll undergo. We, I hope, establish that. Uh, so, I, so I think that death is bad if it's premature and if it's painful. Uh, but but the, the, since there is no state of death for the person, then it, it obviously can't be bad as a as a another sort of experience, real experience could be. So, um, but yeah, I mean, some people say, well, contrast the, the the time before you were born to the time after after you die. You don't exist in either one of those spaces. So why would you worry about the time after you're dead? Well, I take that point, but the fact is. We do want to persist. We do have our projects. Uh, we do want further experiences. Uh, we don't want our loved ones to disappear. So there are many, many respects in which death is bad. <laughs> yeah? And it sounds like you talked about reincarnation. So. Well, right. It's, it's kind of the uh, naturalistic, although I, as I say in the, in the paper, I, I don't want to give the impression of uh, anything mystical, but it does sort of connote or suggest a, um, if not the re certainly not the reincarnation of anything about you, but it suggests that there's something that uh, persists, namely consciousness for itself. I think reincarnation is, is, is about the persistence of something tied to a particular personality or, or uh, context of consciousness, and I'm certainly, I'm saying that's not, that's not the case. Uh, Reincarnation is about something personal that gets, gets carried over and reconstituted so it's recognizably you in some respect, where it has, it has a connection. But since there's no more personal subjective con continuity in, in what I'm saying at death, there's really no um, reincarnation in, in that sense. So, but it, it does have a mystical ring to it, I, I agree, and I admit that uh, because there's some, there's a persistence, persistence, yeah. You kind of talked about individuals, like, like it's being kind of selfish to, for them to look at their own consciousness. Is there consciousness beyond that, like little scales, like all neutrinos, is there a consciousness of the universe? I don't think so. I mean, the evidence <laughs> thus far suggests that consciousness is a system property of at least brains and perhaps other uh, complex objects that are suitably organized. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that neutrinos are consciousness. There is a theory of consciousness called proto-panpsychism or panpsychism, which, which says, as you just suggested, that maybe consciousness has comes in units and that it's attached to uh, subatomic particles or some, some level that isn't a system. But what is the brain? The brain is a very complex system, informational system, representational system. And only when it's doing certain things are you conscious. So that, that's very strong evidence, to me at any rate, that consciousness depends on certain system properties, maybe having to do with it, modeling the world with representation. That's my current guess about why consciousness exists. It has to do with, with modeling the world and, and controlling behavior. And that's what the brain does. Uh, but it's still, it's the hard problem. There's no received explanation of 
of why a system like a brain should produce sensory states and not have everything just go on in the dark. People know about philosophical zombies. Okay, there's, all right. Phil philosophical zombies are just like us, but don't have experience. And David Chalmers, who uh, dubbed this problem the hard problem, he's a philosopher, Australian philosopher, a cool thinker, has this whole thought experiment about zombies. Imagine someone like you, sir, walks and talks just like you, but there's nothing, no lights on inside. And is that conceivable? David Chalmers thinks it is conceivable that consciousness needn't exist, I'm not, I'm not, not so sure, because the evidence is so strong that when a system like the brain does what it does, that system is going to exhibit consciousness, like feel pain or something like that. Um, but so, yeah, I, to answer your question, I don't think there's good evidence for a, a particulate notion or, or universal notion of consciousness. Going to the opposite extreme, I don't see that there's cosmic consciousness attached to anything greater than a, uh, a system like ourselves. Uh, but, I mean, we're always open to new evidence, right? As naturalists, we're non-dogmatic. We don't know everything. If evidence comes along, we change our minds about things. And that's, uh, so who knows? Maybe we will discover there are granules of consciousness or a superordinate consciousness somehow. Connor? Would man-made consciousness be possible under this worldview? Like Future computer that has really great AI, could that be conscious? Absolutely, I, I think so. I, I don't think there's any in principle reason to suppose that machine consciousness isn't, isn't possible. Because after all, if you, if you duplicate what the brain does it, down to, say, a fairly detailed functional level, then there's no reason that I can see that it wouldn't result in sensory states. But of course, why those sensory states would be there is still uh, an open question. Although I do have my hypotheses. Uh, naturalism.org, see that website, that one there? There are a bunch of papers, uh, some of which have been published in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. Uh, I'm working on a couple right now that are, that are not published yet, but they're in draft and have a look at them because they, work, they draw on the work of a, a guy named Thomas Metzinger, who's written a fantastic book called The Ego Tunnel, which I've reviewed at naturalism.org. So if you're interested in consciousness and want a cutting edge theory that I happen to like, not necessarily true, but I happen to like it, it's representationalist, uh, pick up his book called The Ego Tunnel. Uh, he's a German philosopher, superb thinker, superb thinker, and I think he's onto something. Um, what else do I have here? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, be in, you know, be in touch if you, if anyone has uh, wants to correspond about this stuff. Uh, consciousness is a is a super interesting topic. Um, I, I just put out a challenge, uh, Casey, Connor, any of you free think free thinkers, tackle the hard problem. Tackle the hard problem because it's not going to go away, and if you solve it. If you come up with a solution, uh, you'll go down in the, <laughs> in the annals of, of philo-scientific uh, uh, stardom, uh, because it's, it's, to my mind, a, a great unsolved problem. Uh, but, I, but check out Thomas Messinger's stuff. Uh, he, he's great. Right. Well, that's what I would say. I would say that you know, your memory is, your memories get trashed when you die because what are memories? They're nothing independent of what the brain is doing, unless you, right? As a person, as a personal ex experience, they depend on on you. I mean, but if if we could encode your memories in some kind of, some kind of substrate, and of course Ray Kurzweil, some of you might have heard of, uh, is working on this probably. He thinks that, and it's, it's, it's conceivable that you could get your memories into a chip, then upload them into a new body, and there you'd be. And that would be like a transformation thought experiment, but with personal subjective continuity, right? Because you would still be there, but there still wouldn't be any subjective gap. You would have been downloaded, but there would have been no subjective gap or, or pause for you. 
you would suddenly find yourself there in your new, what would it be, a machine maybe. There you are with your memories, and but a new, the new you, new you, but with uh, but recognizing the you. So it's a, that's a, that's another version of the uh, of the transformation thought experiment. But what's being transformed is the external support for you, but your memories are preserved. But right now, no, no way. Sorry. <laughs> but again, what's so great about your memories? Try something new. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we've got, you know. So this is, as I say, make the, make the best of it. I, I think um, it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool because if if we well, I, mean, I won't I won't verbal on. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you've been very patient and very tolerant, but uh, I hope there's at least some plausibility attached. But whatever you do, don't worry about the big the black abyss. Black abyss is not it's not an option. All right, thank you folks.